made encompasses more than one pathology and diagnosis. It's very difficult to, to sort of squeeze it in within 45 minutes or less than one hour or something like that. But I will try to focus on the points which I think are clinically important. Uh, and I would encourage you to you people to ask questions because it's, it, if nobody asks a question and you don't see anyone, then it seems like you are talking to your own computer. So we, first we start with the coarctation. And as usual, the, it, it came from a Latin term, coarctare, which means to contract. So essentially it's a localized narrowing. Usually in the in the aorta, uh, descending aorta, thoracic aorta most commonly. But it has been described even in the abdominal aorta. One, one localized ring-like or small stricture-like narrowing in the aorta. And second, generative narrowing of the descending aorta, usually distal to the most common side, distal to the left subclavian artery. And I'm sure by now you, all of you have seen it. It was described by Morgagni in 1760 in an, in an autopsy specimen. And the incidence is about three to four cases per 1,000 live births. So it's not very uncommon. You, 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 you do encounter it in, a, in all the cardiac centers pretty much regularly. Now I just tried to Photoshop this cartoon which I downloaded from the, from the internet and you can see my bad attempts at that but I want to convey you some messages here. Number one, if you see this part of the aorta, that is the ascending aorta which I'm, we are talking about the normal aorta, then this is the proximal aorta which is usually anterior. When we open the sternum as all of you know, this part is anterior and then there is a posterior part of the aorta which where the aorta tend to dive backwards toward the left side. And then that, though this is part of the arch of the aorta, but it's more posterior. This is not a good depiction, but the coarctation is usually around where the ductus is inserted, where the PDA is. And most common site, as we discussed, is dist distal to the left subclavian artery. But that's not, that's, this cartoon basically I wanted to tell you the aorta for the surgeon, one part is anterior, which is, which is readily accessible. And then one portion of the arch goes backward for which you need to detect backwards into the mediastinum. And that's how, that's how we, we see it. Now, if there's a coarctation, then the presentation can be of two types. The one like bimodal presentation as we call it, Presenting in the first week of life, very early, the baby is comes in a shock and he's a pink baby. Or he can come as a congestive heart failure. But usually, we have seen them presenting in the ER, a pink baby who comes in a shock-like state. Why shock-like state? Because his ductus, which was supporting the circulation to the lower part of the body, has just obliterated and then he goes into shock and you have to resuscitate this baby with prostaglandin infusion. Uh, this is an extreme form of presentation and you have to do it something like urgently or emer emergency surgery. Uh, the other is asymptomatic. This is the other extreme. Like this is a kind of uh, a spectrum of the disease. So on the other extreme, there will be, be people who are asymptomatic and they present later in life, even in adulthood or late adulthood with hypertension or somebody who is a good clinician and on every clinical examination, he, he or she checks all the peripheral pulses. We'll notice that the lower pulses are weak or lower extremity pulses like femoral or they are even altogether absent and raise a suspicion of coarctation. Obviously, then you will put your stethoscope, if you are still using the stethoscope on a stair step, you might hear a murmur. Uh, so they can be asymptomatic, just presenting like somebody who is hypertensive 
So part of your hypertension assessment should be to look for the coarctation or rule out the coarctation, which could be like an anatomical type of hypertension due to some lesion. But it doesn't mean that they live normally or their lifespan is normal. Actually, the asymptomatic ones or all of the unrepaired coarctations, their lifespan is markedly reduced. I want I would emphasize this point in the next slide, inshallah. Uh, Victor, so yeah. uh, when, when we have a patient in shock, they give him prostaglandin. Uh, I know that the uh, coarctation part of the aorta contains ductal tissue. Does that mean that when we give prostaglandin fusion, we relax the aorta itself? It, it will, because part of the, the ductal tissue is surrounding the, 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 the isthmus of the aorta. It's not mm -hmm. that the ductal tissue extends. Let me go back to the previous one. Can you see my marker? The arrow? Um, I said, I, I see a black arrow. The coarctation of the water. Black, this is the arrow. coarctation area. Yeah. But this ductal tissue is extended here in all this area. Yeah. So that can also relax. Yes. Prostaglandin will be part of your resuscitation mayor in most of the neonates, almost all of the neonates who come in extremis and you suspect a congenital heart disease. Right? Right. And prostaglandin, the ductus though it closes, but it is up to up to the first 10 days or two weeks, it can reopen with the infusion of the prostaglandin. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's okay. the rationale for, for using prostaglandin in these children. Mm. But yes, they do present, you will see in your in your clinical career, um, babies brought to the ER being resuscitated, they are pink, and then they are in shock-like state, and then you you just they just start prostaglandin, and then when you you take you have a little bit of breathing space, and they are a little bit resuscitated, and an echo is done, for, you find a coarctation. Mm -hmm. Right. So we go to the ones which present later in life and whatever they can present later in life, and as I said, some of them will not know. Somebody will come just for to his GP or whatever for a blood pressure check and they find he's hypertensive and the things take off from there. Then we go to the other category, how we look at them. It can be an isolated coarctation, but a large number of coarctation is associated with other abnormalities. And the commonest association with coarctation is bicuspid aortic valve. Then all types of aortic arch hyperplasia or like a shown complex where there are multiple level of obstruction on the left side of the heart, starting from the uh, supramitral membrane, then mitral stenosis, then subaortic stenosis, aortic stenosis, coarctation, all, 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 all the way going in, in that in that in, in that sequence. Ventricular septal defects are also commonly associated with coarctation, uh, and the other anomalies which are DRV, TGA hypoplastic, left heart syndrome, everything, almost everything you can find associated with hypoplastic. So don't forget that there, there can be an associated congenital heart defect. But there are certain syndromes like Turner syndrome and Jacobson syndrome. Whenever you see a baby with that, with particular facies of Turner's, um, scan them, screen them for hypoplastic. And uh, Quite a few, quite a quite a big percentage of them will have coarctation. Okay, so this is from a paper which was actually I think we are not going to see any more of papers like that. It was published in 1970 in the in then the British Medical Journal, a British Heart Journal. Sorry, uh, this is a natural history paper, and that uh, that is often quoted that the prognosis without treatment, the outcome is poor. And this is a clinical and autopsy record of 465 patients who had coarctation, isolated coarctation we are talking about. But their mean age of death was 34 years. Now, as you know now, the mean age of death is now not 34 years, it's way beyond it. And actually 74% were dead by 43 years of age. So it means even isolated coarctation causes you a lot of problem and reduces your lifespan by 20 to 30 years. So it's not, not 
just a benign disease. You may think that he was asymptomatic because his coaptation was not severe, but still, it has it affects his uh, his long term survival. And the same paper, they found out that the causes of de of death, why they died. You can see horrible things: intracranial hemorrhage, twelve percent; bacterial endocarditis, eighteen percent; aortic rupture, twenty-one percent; and congestive heart failure, twenty-six percent. So yes, uh, this is how the 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 pie chart of the of the complications leading to death uh, were presented in that paper. That just emphasizes that coagulation is not a benign disease. Now, how do we diagnose coagulation? Uh, diagnostic tests or whatever, just X-ray. Now, to be honest with you, it only comes in the exam sometimes. They show you a chest X-ray. Uh, there is a reverse three sign or notching of the posterior fourth to eighth rib. But to be honest with you, practically we never diagnose coagulation on, on chest X. -ray. Yeah, you diagnose coagulation, then you go back and look at the chest X-ray, and then you find all these signs. Chest X-rays are pretty much unremarkable. But the gold standard is echo in most of the children and, and adults, and it will give you the, the, the exact diagnosis of the coagulation. Older children and adults who have suboptimal echo windows, and you're still suspecting coagulation because of your clinical findings, Ask for a CT, and that will show you. A CT angiogram will very nicely show you. MRI will give you very good 3D images, and also will define the extent of the lesion and quantity of the collateral flow. Now, the last one is cardiac catheterization. Now, cardiac catheterization is actually now competing with the surgical intervention, or in, in some cases where there is other lesions associated with coagulation, and you want some hemodynamic data, then that in only in those cases, you will have a diagnostic cat. But mostly the cat is done for therapeutic reasons, therapeutic purpose. And they treat, and the types of coagulation and the, and the, the presentation with that, which are being treated by the, by the cat lab, uh, by cat intervention is increasing. And we will discuss it further. So an echo will show you very nicely. You are looking from the top, and you can see the the arch and the last branch, and then you see this narrowing here. We just show you this uh, uh, this, this mosaic flow here, which is with the with the color, which which depicts rightly the area of the of the of of, of the narrowing, and you can. Appreciate that after the narrowing, there is some dilatation. There's, the, the flow has got more. Uh, echo mostly will pick up not only this region, but will also tell you has he got a bicuspid aortic valve, a VSD associated with, or other lesion. So um, echo gives you more information uh, instantaneously and in a non invasive way and has become the gold standard for this reason. That you know way and beyond the coagulation area. But what else is wrong with the baby? Uh, this is how the coagulation was actually treated. And if you see this timeline, the surgery on in the yellow, then the resection and end to end anastomosis was, was done in 1945 because it's a discrete lesion, so the surgeons could. Could cut it out and sew it back together. And then you can see Gross did an interposition graft after resecting the, the uh, equaptation in 1951. So it's almost, more, almost, let's say, more than 70, 75 years that surgery has been done. For, and then it went to prosthetic patch aortoplasty that you put a patch on the narrow area. Then came subclavian flap aortoplasty in the children in 1966. And anyway, by the by the mid 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 eighties, balloon angioplasty was introduced by Locke and Locke and colleagues, I think in Boston. And they started ballooning the area, the narrow area in the children. 
and then came in 1991 endovascular stent implantation and now in 1999 double platinum stents have been introduced and now there are stents which can be put in children maybe around 10 15 kg of weight and then they can be further dilated in the course of the time they can be dilated up to a normal 20 millimeter diameter of the descending aorta. So CATH is here started to overlap with the, surgery, with the surgical correction and it is, I think the technology is improving. This is a, an, what you will, if in a discrete coarctation we are, we are talking about a juxta ductal or around the duct coarctation, which if you can appreciate there's a coarctation here, this is the, the arc, this is the subclavian artery, which, is, which has the blue pressure loop. You can see a, a tie around the, the ductus. So that's how it looks. And if, I don't know if, how clear these pictures are to you, you can see one or two of the, the upper one uh, intercostal artery. Yeah. Intercostals. Yeah, multiple, multiple kits which has been dissected and divided. Now, why this dissection and division is necessary? Because if we are going to cut a portion of this aorta and remove all the co-op segment with the area which has ductal tissue, then you have, you have good mobility of the arch and neck vessels to bring it back together. And in the smaller children and neonates, because the, the, the tissues are more elastic, I would say, and pliable, if we mobilize very nicely the, the arch vessels and, and the descending thoracic aorta right down as far as we can go. Uh, we can cut a big segment. By big segment, I mean almost around one centimeter and still we are able to pull it together and do an end-to-end -end anastomosis or an extended end-to-end -end anastomosis, which is the preferred method in neonates and children and small children. So when we look at the cut specimen, this is the dilated part, which is this part, which is the descending aorta. And you can see a nice shelf in there. And this is the ductus ligated. So that's how it looks. Now, more than once, I have to, I had to deal with it because it was, we diagnosed him in the echo and whatever. That's a, a coarctation, a discrete coarctation. But when you, you go there, you find it's not a discrete coarctation. It's actually, this is the left subclavian. That is the arch of the aorta. This big thing is the ductus supplying the lower part. And the distal, the isthmus part of the, of the descending aorta is very narrow, very hypoplastic. Even then, with good mobilization and whatever, and some pull and push, we end up with an anastomosis like this, which is actually cutting this around here and bringing it right under the arch of the uh, under the arch of the aorta, as you can see it here, and they work. The problem is that you have to, to mobilize and and decide: is it going to come together? Uh, and 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 an anastomosis under tension can be risky, can bleed. And number two, if it's too much under tension, it will cause stenosis later. But these days, if it, the stenosis happens after three to four weeks, five weeks, they can take them to the cath lab and, and the loading. So re coarctation is a problem because we do not cut away all the ductal tissue. The duct doesn't stop here. The duct goes down into the upper part of the, of the descending root and that also has ductal tissue. Um, I, I think this, you might have seen this type of a cartoon. What is available to us? We divide the ductus and do this end-to-end -end anastomosis. We can put a patch on it. Yeah, if it is too tense, you cannot bring it together. I think you have to bail yourself out, open it and put any patch, vortex patch, pericardial patch, whatever is available to you, to bail yourself out. The other one, which is the old school of surgeons, they knew it because they were doing it and the younger generation is not familiar with it is to divide the subclavian artery, the left subclavian artery, open it right down across the coarctation segment, about one centimeter or so, and use the subclavian as a flap, left subclavian flap. Obviously you sacrifice the subclavian artery and there's a little risk 
by little we mean 1% risk of acute ischemia to the to that left arm or hand so you have to if whenever you take a patient for a coarctation repair you have to inform the parent that in case you use a supplement lab there is 1% risk of 1% uh, risk of hand ischemia which is not something which uh, uh, anybody likes yeah sorry so but uh, in, in the subclavian flap technique, we didn't uh, uh, remove all the ductal tissue. No. Right? And the posterior it part. It's it still there. Yeah, no, no. You, yeah. you don't. You, you, you cut the ductus here, but the ductal yeah. tissue is still there. You go beyond it. Mm. You, go, you go more downward up from the distal tissue. That's why I'm saying you have to go almost one centimeter, 1.5 centimeter below where the ductus is. So the recurrence rate in this, uh, the in this rate technique has is been, higher. Yeah, yes, the recurrence is there, but not much higher than the other other technique. Surprisingly, mm, because this the subclavian flap is a living flap and it continues to grow. I think, and that's how okay. it accommodates. Yeah, and uh, okay. then there is this extended end to end anastomosis, which I showed you in the previous picture, that you bring the cut end under to the under surface of the arch. And the anastomosis is not straight end to end like two tubes, two tubes. It's a little bit beveled, as much beveled as you can. But obviously, the key to, to, to these types of good repairs are mobilization. Now, mobilization becomes more and more difficult as the age of the patient increases. And when they are younger children or, or, or teenagers, it's not possible to mobilize all and remove all the segments. That's why you need. In some of these cases, you need to put an interposition graft. An interposition graft, you need to uh, have available of, uh, before you take a, a patient to the war. Obviously, as every surgery is planned. So remember that in, in, in the bigger children, you might need an interposition graft. So make sure it's available and make sure that uh, there is a technique of doing a left heart bypass. You support them with some bypass. It's not a full bypass. It's just you support you do a femoral cannulation for the arterial, and you can take the venous return from one of his pulmonary veins by one angled cannula, and just flow a liter or a liter and a half. So the upper part of the body, when you are clamped, is supplied by the by the beating heart itself, mm -hmm. and the lower part you supply with with your pump. You like read about shunt. sorry. It's like a shunt only. Like not shunt, it's support, support of the lower part of the body. It's called left heart bypass. Read about left heart bypass and or talk to your perfusionist who have done it. They will No, they will. we talked about it before. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So okay. left heart bypass in, in especially in the redos. If you have to do a redo, there'll be lots of adhesion and whatever. So it it's it's very it's very, very safe to, to be prepared with the left heart bypass. And you do it nicely and you're not rushed. You're not worried about the, the clamp times and all those complications. And obviously, if you do, in very rare cases, you have to, to put an interposition graft, which is extra anatomical. So you bypass the, the, the coact area. And I have just seen one or two in my career. And I, these were the, the children who had so many interventions previously that the area was not amenable to any further surgery. All, all, all the mediastinum was stuck. So you, you can put an interposition ground between the ascending aorta and the descending aorta, just, just below the heart, above the diaphragm, or you have to open the diaphragm and go down. Uh, not needed mostly these days because the, the stents and the covered stents have taken care of most of these the complex ones. Uh, obviously, any surgery has a problem. Has a you know, I mean, like what we call it in Arabic, not he doesn't die, but he can have some, some issues. Hemorrhage, you can all understand. But the one which we all read is paraplegia. Why paraplegia? Because for a certain length of time, which could be even up to 45 minutes, though we try to be quicker than that, and most of the time, an end-to-end -end anastomosis in a neonate or a small child can be done within 25 minutes or 30 minutes or something. But 
clamping can cause problem because the famous artery of Adam Quicks or whatever the blood supply to the spinal cord is 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 compromised. And actually, some people who looked at it more carefully, they thought that the spinal cord blood supply is compromised if the lower part of the body, if you have a femoral arterial line, if the blood pressure is below a certain number. But how how else you can help? Number one is that is you have to reduce your clamp time to as minimum as possible. Though children have tolerated up to 45, even 50 minutes of clamping of the aorta. Systemically cool the patient. The patient is in a thoracotomy position and you can get the, a cooling blanket under him and especially small children get rapidly cooled and cool him down to 35, 34 degrees where he doesn't fibrillate, but he's still cool. And these three, four, five degrees provide you some uh, protection from spinal cord injury. Also, I have constantly used uh, one gram per kg IV uh, mannitol just before I put the clamps on. Somebody taught me, don't ask me about the science, maybe it is, it, it, it is a free radical scavenger or whatever, just before cross clamp clamping for, for aortic, uh, for quotation, uh, the anesthetist has, has it already prepared one gram per, per kg of the body weight of mannitol, 100 units per kg of heparin, and one milligram per kg of dexamethasone. This is a cocktail which was used in Cincinnati, and I've used it. And luckily, I've not seen a paraplegia or monoplegia after operation, though I had sometimes problems with longer cramps, and I don't wish to see it. Uh, chylothorax is very common because we dissect in the in the in the in the mediastinum up and down, and the children can have prolonged chylos drainage. You can understand that the nerve injury is recurrent pudendal nerve injury and the Horner syndrome because uh, ansa cervicalis passes below the subclavian artery on the left side. Uh, phrenic nerve injury is also there. Phrenic nerve injury obviously you will have to then deal with the diaphragm in some of these. Especially the children below six months of age, they do not tolerate a phrenic nerve injury very well. And you will have problem extubating him and he will be struggling with the respiratory issues. So if the child is below six months of age and you confirm a phrenic nerve injury, don't waste time with just try to get the diaphragm. They, they do much better after that. Uh, left arm ischemia, which we said, stroke obviously can is possible. Recoaptation, at least 10% of the Neonates and children will have recoaptation. But this recoaptation rate is much less than just by ballooning. If you balloon, then the recoaptation rate have been reported to be upwards of 70 to 80%, even 90% will recoapt. Neonates, we are talking about. Older children and adults, the story is different. And also, it, aneurysm formation, especially with the patches, uh, vortex patches, or not the aneurysms don't form early, they form very late. Sometimes they, they form like 20 years later. But, be, but because of the differential stress characteristic of the patch and the native aorta, the, this is the theory that the, the blood flow stress is dissipated in a way that that area becomes weaker and weaker. And right where you put the patch, there comes as an aneurysm. Uh, yeah, so the have a look at these, these. Look at the picture on your right, and you see a nice coaptation. This is a, an adult, and then in the same area, a, a stent is being deployed, and with the balloon, they are opening the waist of that area, and this is the result. Very nice, uh, the stent is there, and you cannot argue with that. And this, this modality of angioplasty and with the covered stent has taken up a lot of our work, which used to be in children, let's say, three years, four years, age and, and beyond. And almost, almost rare, it's rare to see an adult population being presented for surgical correction. 
and these but these are injected like, for for sorry. three years, four years. Children wouldn't they uh, grow um, uh, out of their stent, and then it will. No, the stent they can balloon the stent again and 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 to expand expand it further. There are newer stents. Oh, okay. I was surprised. I was shocked. Like you, a few months ago, when somebody told me that a six millimeter stent, they can balloon it sequentially up to twenty millimeters. Okay, so yeah. they bring them back again and again to yeah, yeah. Uh, dilate they, they, while they grow. They, they remain under follow up, hmm. and they keep on doing echoes. And if they find a, a gradient or a, or an anatomical narrowing again, they take them back to cath lab and dilate it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just to have a comment about this because the, so the stents that they use for coarks uh, in the cath lab are open cell stents, which means that there are uh, incomplete connections between the cells of the stent, so they can actually break them. Yes, so yes, when they say when they, so there are two different so this is important for the new generation of cardiac surgeons to you know understand what's the difference between the stents that they yeah, put they're, in the cath lab. They're, they're open. Open cells, yeah. as you said. Yeah. yeah. So, they can, so they can actually. So, if you guys know what's an accordion, it's a, like a instru musical instrument that you can stretch and like. So what, that's what happens when they stretch mm -hmm. the balloon, the stent. They actually shorten. So yes. what? So it so it it's, they stretch it and it shortens and it shortens. And because it's a chronic fibrosis, they are less likely to rupture. But they have to put another covered stent. So they cannot exactly. do. They cannot do uncovered stent uh, in an in open set stent because there is a risk of uh, sub dissection uh, in 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 the in the, in the dissection in the cardiac dissection uh, in ah sorry I forgot what uh, there is a risk of the micro dissection yes, yes. and then the, the patient will go home and present back in two or three weeks with massive hemothorax so that's what they yes. do they break the stent and then directly put the stent that size that is appropriate of the, what they want. What they can yeah, do is they can increase the size of the stent by 50%. That's it. Other than that, there is a risk of rupture. There is. So I would think the covered the stent the inside the uncovered stent. Yes. All the, well, a stent a covered in a covered in a covered. All, mm -hmm. all the stents basically rupture the intima and media. And all the ballooning does that. So, so, but now this covered stent has provided them with another toy or tool, whatever you call it, that they can bail, bail themselves out when they when they put a stent and balloon it, they obviously do another angiogram. And if they see any micro leak, whatever, they go ahead and put another covered stent inside. And, and, and that covers it. And this is how the covered stents are. They are platinum alloys and they are covered with a Gore-Tex. I think some of them now are covered also from the inside. Gore-Tex on outside and Gore-Tex on inside. And they, they take care of the micro, micro dissection, the micro rupture. So anyway, this is a modality which is still improving and we will see in the future, in coming years, more yeah. and more. And, and it's not uh, interventional only. So there are some new generation cardiac surgeons that do this also. So they have a, yeah, trained, a, trained to do that. Uh, if you ask my opinion, if somebody is going to be a cardiac surgeon in the next 10 years, he should learn the catheter skills as well. And there are fellowship programs which are for you one or two years after you finish your surgery, a, a catheter intervention. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, Dr. Arzaz? Yeah. Uh, can I uh, comment? This is Abdurov. Sure, Abdurov. Uh, uh, for uh, now, the surgical uh, coarctation mostly is a systemic uh, duct dependent systemic circulation. Uh, yeah. In your unit. Uh, now, uh, bigger infant uh, uh, and ch child uh, more than uh, uh, is either for balloon or or, 50, uh, or uh, stent. Stent yeah. usually yeah. classically above 15 kg. But yeah. if you look to to the diameter of the aorta in those uh, kids above 15 kg and adult, they, it's not that much different. No. No. And in fact, uh, the primary is, is a bare metal stent because most of the time it touched the origin of the left subclavian. Yes. Uh, now, if there is a risk of, uh, if, if, if the dilatation is so much uh, enhanced, then they put a, a, a covered stent, especially in the cases of uh, acquired interruption of the aorta yes. because uh, the, the risk of rupture is almost there.
Sure. Uh, they used in 90s and early 2000 plus to have what we call it a biodegradable stint, but unfortunately the the result is not that good. Yeah, I didn't catch up. Yes, yes. Okay, so we'll carry on because of time. I would. so conclusion is that the diagnosis is indication for intervention. Now intervention then it becomes a decision which has to be based on a discussion. In, in not we are not talking about the neonatal or early drug said the drug dependent ones who are not going to survive without uh, uh, without surgical intervention. The one who are bigger children and adults, then it has to be a, 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 a team decision depending on what is available to, the, to that area or center at that time. With consideration of the age and patient's anatomy and associated lesion, if he's going for some other uh, surgery, some other intracardiac lesion, then yeah, cooperation can be repaired at the same time. Let's change gears and go to PDA. Now, PDA. Dr. Atizaz. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, if you allow me, I'm Haikun Al Bar, uh, cardiac surgery, uh, R7. Uh, so the most, uh, just to, to, to summarize something, uh, what, I, what, what I know, the, the best uh, modality for treatment of the quark is extended end-to-end -end anastomosis because uh, and you do, uh, it's depend on um, resection of all ductal tissue. Yeah. And, in, and in younger uh, children is, or in adult, young adult, uh, the stent is the first uh, modality to be chosen because of the collaterals that and the carrier risk of uh, paraplegia plus a risk of uh, bleeding because yes. of the development of the collaterals. And in case of uh, that, it's not amenable with extra cardiac, I mean with uh, intracardiac uh, pathology like aortic regurgitation in case of bicuspid, either stent then uh, fix a uh, uh, aortic valve or the one with extra anatomical bypass. Yes, yeah. So this is the more, yeah, and this is the summary about the most important things because it, we've been asked in the exam about this, yeah, and, uh, especially about this and the subclavian, uh, uh, subclavian flap only for very, for neonatal age. Yes. Is that right also? Yeah, yeah. Beyond neonatal age, using a cutting a subclavian has higher risk. In, High, in higher our, risk for uh, yeah, of, of limb ischemia. Okay, appreciating. So next is the is the PDA. Now PDA is obviously an arterial connection between pulmonary artery and aorta, and it has to be there because of the fetal circulation to direct blood from pulmonary to the aorta before birth. The lungs are not working, pulmonary resistance is high, and the blood has to go down one of these shunts, which is, as if you are, if uh, you are, you're all familiar with, uh, or you should be familiar with the, uh, uh, the circulation in a fetus, and it has more than one level of shunts, and one of them is PDA. And it closes spontaneously after birth, usually within 24 hours, more than I think, if bigger than 90% will be closed after 24 hours. But if it persists with the lumen, then we call it a patent ductus arteriosus. I mean, obviously, if it obliterates, then it becomes a ductus. And we add a patent to it if it has lumen inside. Uh, etiology is that the, that the prostaglandins, which are secreted locally as well as from the blood, from placenta, and low oxygen saturation, they keep the PDA open. And uh, as after birth, the prostaglandin supply from the placenta is gone, and also the local prostaglandin can change, and the oxygen saturation is increased because the lungs are working, and PDA starts to close. Uh, prematurity is incidence is higher, and in low birth weight babies, and up to 30% will have a, a significant PDA, and that's what they need. They need a PDA to survive. But also some of the syndromes, trisomy 21 and some other chromosomal abnormalities they're associated with more PDA. 
rubella infections, ACE inhibitors have been implicated. So these are, I mean, bookish etiologies of the PDA. But the thing to understand is that a three millimeter or four millimeter PDA causes more problem than a three millimeter VSD or other shunt, intracardic shunt, because the aorta to pulmonary shunting is in the both phases of cardiac cycle. Systemic as well as that. So that's why, because of this increased shunting mechanism, the PTA, even the same diameter PTA will give you more problem, let's say three or four millimeter diameter PTA as compared to three or four millimeter BSD in a unit or a child. And obviously the shunting will depend on that, not only on the size of the duct, but also on the pulmonary and systemic vascular resistance. If the resistance is high on the, resistance is low on the pulmonary side, then there'll be more shunting. Uh, so as 99% of them will be closed by within a few weeks and only less than 1% will have PDA by the age of one month, detectable PDA. But it, on a very small PDA, which is not causing symptoms, you can sit and watch it and for a few doctor, months. Yeah. Just regarding the last thing you said about the resistance and the, and the shunt. So when we have a bidirectional shunt in the BDA, uh, can we say that this is a sign that we have a, a significant um, pulmonary pressure? Pulmonary the pressure, yeah, where the, so I here so. the pulmonary pressure is in diastole is, and pulmonary pressure is higher during diastole than the systemic diastolic pressure. That's why it causes the reverse shunt. Exactly. Right. Yeah. But, so, Sorry, yeah. Okay. So, so, so if we have a patient with bidirectional shunt, is there anything to add in their uh, pre-operative uh, assessment regarding their pulmonary you know, the, uh, resistance? You know, the, the, the resistance will continue to fall naturally. Mm. And you have to follow it. You have to follow the, the child closely, clinically, as well as with repeat echoes. After surgery? Yeah. Or after no, before but I mean, before. Yeah. Okay. Uh, surgery or whatever mod modality of treatment you apply. Now, isolated, untreated hemodynamically PTA is again not a benign lesion. And uh, I will, you will be surprised that mortality can be up to 30% if a significant PTA is there within first year of life. So PTAs are not something which you can, which you can ignore for, for months. You have to if there's a small PDA and the child is not that much symptomatic, yeah, you can follow. But if he's developing signs of clinical signs or echoes, uh, parameters of dilatation of the heart or congestive heart failure, you have to think about it. You cannot leave it alone. Uh, PDA is a funny lesion because it has three first. It was the first lesion treated surgically. And I think that's started the, the congenital heart surgery when Gross ligated a PDA in 1938. And it was also treated, the first region to be treated by percutaneous intervention in 1967. And it was the first region treated pharma, pharmacologically, as you know, by endomethacine uh, in 1976. And these days, again, in neonatal PDA, usually the first trial is for medical treatment, treated by pharmacological manipulation. Uh, and uh, it is done commonly in the, in the neonatal ICUs. To diagnose PDA, you don't need much. You just, just clinically, if you can hear a machinery murmur with hyperactive precordium and you ask for an echo, that will tell you that there's a PDA. But the, the, the clinical symptoms will develop and will depend on the, again, Systemic and pulmonary vascular resistance is because it's shunt between the two, two, two resistance systems. So if the pulmonary resistance continues to fall, the shunt will continue to increase. And anatomy, anatomy we mean mostly the size of the ductus and age of the patient. Uh, smaller children, they get affected more. Uh, obviously in premature babies, the shunt is obligatory, otherwise they will go into, into right side heart failure. And as lung resistance falls and pulmonary overcirculation, 
congestive heart failure develops and they are they are noticed to be not being able to be weaned from ventilation and that's what that's when the the the, the neonatal icu people start to look for uh, modalities of treatment infants and older children they will they might present with congestive heart failure or they might have fatigue recurrent chest infection uh, and in adults or bigger children can be asymptomatic on on the other extreme we have all seen patients who are inoperable and present with eisenmenger syndrome just because of the pda uh, which was which was missed or ignored over uh, we, we we talked about the pharma, pharmacological manipulation pharmacological manipulation also takes the shape of heart failure treatment diuretics is inhibitors in some cases you might need to do inotropic support and indomethacine and recently ibuprofen has been used to close the pda because of it's a prostaglandin inhibitor uh, and has lesser side effects than indomethacine but surgical in a premature baby we are talking about the pd in the premature baby i find bedside ligation to be the most logical and easiest you need to have a team with you but you also need the icu the, the neonatal icu team to be around why i'm saying that because when you a baby was a premature was less than let's say 1500 grams or around 1 kg the you our anesthetists are not that much experienced with intubating them and when you are trying to position it and he gets he gets accidentally extubated they are trying to put him left side up or even they they are not able to ventilate them the way how small tidal volume they need so i think the icu team has to be around there and uh, moving the child from from a neonatal icu to the or and back has its risk including the risk of hypothermia and ex- accidental extubation which we discussed so to in to my mind the, the best is you, you develop a team approach and go to the to the neonatal icu you take your or nurse with you take your anesthetist and assistants and everything diathermy and your 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 head lights and whatever and do it on the bed side clean it try to put the baby in a cell in a in a isolated room if you want uh, but for me it's easier to do it in the in the bed side and we did quite a few uh, usually almost always never had a problem because or everybody was present there if he gets extubated then the unit icu team was present there and they did intubate them without a problem so airway compromise hypothermia loss of iv access this all can happen when you are when you are doing a bedside ligation but the idea is to make a small record we do minimal dissection identify the anatomy and do the minimum just put a big a medium sized ligature clip uh, sometimes you can ligate it but the more you try to do it is a very thin wall structure and can rupture and that will be the end of the the procedure the other thing is which happens is it can you ligate a pda and the, and a coaptation is unmasked so you have to ask them with a follow up echo whatever to see if that area where you ligate is the ductus is it involved in the in the development of a coaptation which could which could really rapidly show you within the next day or two so the idea of of, of a check echo is not to check that has you ligated the pda or you have most likely ligated it or or, or click or could it with the clip but look for the coaptation the infants and children again the cath lab has taken over mostly they are closed with devices very rarely we get a child in which there is a very large pda or very almost something looking like an ap window that they send to us you like get this in the in the or so failed device closures is mostly in infants and children our indication for surgery and muscle sparing for record means are better for thoracoscopic procedures where that type of procedures can be done they the possible the expertise is there uh, they are very much possible adults are mostly closed with the devices very rarely a 
an adult will be presented to you for surgical closure. But beware of the adult PDA. Adult PDA is a difficult situation. It is usually calcified and and friable. You have the best way is to do a medium sternotomy. And there are instances when you may need a cardiopulmonary bypass and you cannot ligate the duct because so friable and thick. You just open the PA and patch it from inside. So adult PDA is very rare in clinical presentation. Uh, I don't know if the roof has seen some, but it's very rare to ligate, ligate PDA in adults these days. Next, we, we jump to the other topic which is comes under this arch anomaly, this intrapediotic arch. Now for intrapediotic arch, we have to have a little bit of background of, uh, of the, how the arch is developed, the embryology. Uh, I think at certain stage, we all look like a fish or as from our religious uh, teachings, we know that all the life originated in the water. Uh, that makes a lot of sense to me when you think why we develop bronchial arches when we are just an, an embryo. We develop fish-like gill system of six bronchial arches uh, in the region of the neck, which have their own arteries, and then they join. We have at that time a ventral aorta and two dorsal aorta which join together when one become one dorsal aorta. But anyway, the, the first and second bronchial arches, they contribute to the face arteries. So that they don't contribute very much to the aortic arch tissue. Third, third, third bronchial arch artery, third becomes the carotid artery on both right and left side. It is the fourth one which is important. The fourth, mostly on the left side, will become the arch. But fourth on the right side can also persist and can give you a right side arch, or in cases of the double aortic arch, both fourth, right, and left can persist or group. So remember the fourth arch, fourth bronchial arch for the aortic arch. The fifth one involutes totally in, in human beings. And the sixth, they contribute to the pulmonary arteries both on the right and left. But the sixth left, the, the, the ventral part of it go, the, becomes the part of the ductus arterius. So, that, that's, that shows why the ductus is usually attached to the origin or near the left pulmonary artery, because it embryologically arises from there. Again, the same story, right and left, first and second become part of the face arteries. Remember, the third one developed into carotid arteries. Fourth one contributes to the aortic arch normally. The right, the, no, the the right will develop into part of the arch and proximal right subclavian artery. By the left goes to develop in a normal situation to the left arch. Fifth will involute and sixth will develop into pulmonary arteries on, on the right and left side. But how does the arch develop? If you can see it, again, I downloaded it and tried to modify it for you. The proximal part of the arch is actually part of the cono truncus. Then starts the contribution of the fourth fourth left bronchial arch. And at the level of the isthmus, which is here, the sixth bronchial arch, the ductus, is joining the fourth arch and the left dorsal aorta. So this area lot almost three different embryological uh, origin arteries. They join together, artery from bronchial arch, the sixth one, and left dorsal aorta and the fourth bronchial arch. So this area is usually uh, more contribution from more than one embryological origin. I tried to, to draw this cartoon because even the, this is a, a, a easy classification of interruption, which was which was a Leora and Patton classification from 1959, and, so in, and as a surgeon we use it. And we usually get confused, where is A and where is B? The B is in the middle, that's okay. But A is distal to the left subclavian artery. Interruption distal to the left subclavian artery is A. Interruption between the left subclavian and left common carotid is B. And between the left 
common carotid and the innominate artery, which is the first artery from the aorta, is the C. So the C is more proximal and the A is distal to the left subclavian artery. Sometimes when we are talking to the cardiology colleagues, we, we get confused. So you have to ask exactly where they mean is the coarctation, distal to what, or the interruption, sorry. So uh, this is how it is. A is distal to the left subclavian artery. All three major arteries of the arch are coming off, and then there's an interruption. And the, the PTA and the ductal arch and descending aorta is going down there. In in the B type, the left subclavian artery comes off from the uh, from the after the interruption from the part which is thoracic aorta, and the interruption is between the left common carotid and left left subclavian artery. This B type is the most common one, uh, and the type C, which is very proximal one, is rather rare, but it is. Only the subclavian artery comes from the ascending aorta. The other two neck vessels they come from the from the part which is distal to the to the interruption. But as you can see in all of them, the lower part of the body is supplied by the by the PDA, the big ductus and the ductal arch goes down. Now the interruption obviously is a congenital anomaly, but the fetal circulation is not, not affected because it said that less than 10% of the fetal cardiac output goes through the aortic isthmus. The upper part, the three branches in a normal situation will be, will be pumped by the, by the heart and the lower part of the body is provided by the ductus. So the, the flow through the distal to the left subclavian part of the aortic isthmus is less than 10% normally. So these, these children are not affected, their growth is not affected. Prenatal diagnosis is possible. But when they present, they present like early coarctation or extreme form of like pink babies who are in distress and who need to be resuscitated. So resuscitate them. Don't rush to take them to the OR. Prostaglandin, treat metabolic acidosis, manipulate the PVR by if they need soda by carb or whatever. Give them some anotrophs to do. Medically resuscitate the child. You can even keep them on prostaglandins for two weeks and continue to be, take them to the OR in, in, an, in an optimal fashion if possible. And more often this is possible. What I'm trying to say is that if a coarctation is presented, uh, interruption is presented to you, don't try to rush it. You have time to stabilize it and treat him in the ICU and, and, and plan it accordingly when he's in a better shape. And he will be in a better shape if. If he, if he gets optimal med medical management in the intensive pediatric intensive care unit. Type B is most common, as I said, and the most common association with type B is a posterior deviation of the septum, which leads to left ventricular protract obstruction to certain degree. Mostly it is not extreme, but there is some left, some deviation. It's also associated with an aberrant right subclavian artery. And remember, these are they can be conotrunkal anomalies, so they are, deep, they are associated with 22 micro deletion de George syndrome. But an interrupted arch can be associated with a single ventricle, with a truncus, with DGAs, complete every canal, they're all known association. But commonest association, BSD with posterior deviation in the type B interruption. How we repair the, the interrupted aortic arch? You can do two stage repairs, or one stage repair, whatever you call it. But one stage repair has, has I think, is, is the preferred one which is done these days. And the surgical mortality has significantly improved in large volume centers to less than 10%. Uh, it does have, even when you repair in one stage, Significant left ventricular outflow tract obstruction can develop and reintervention is possible in up to 50% of the children in the early childhood. So you have to, to follow up on the LVO. Now we are talking about the commonest variety, which is type B, which has an associated BSD with posterior deviation 
in one stage you can repair the intraperiodic art as well as the MDS. And that is the one stage repair. Left bronchial compression is peculiar to this because the anastomosis of the where you re rejoin the interpret portion can be compressing on the left bronchus and you have to look for it in uh, actively in, in post repair children. What has worked in my hands or what I would prefer to do in an interruption, I try to draw this cartoon for you. Uh, let's say it's a type B interruption, this is a PDA supply. So actually, I, for the aortic cannulation, I have used two cannulas. An astromose, a 3.5 millimeter Gore-Tex tube and put an eight French cannula here. And on a Y, now this is something which I have done like almost in half a dozen children and I was surprised how I could do it and gives, it's not, not that difficult as you might think. Now you might notice that I have put the, a cannula in the descending aorta just above the diaphragm. Yes, it is possible. From the right side. And you push the heart a little bit towards left with, with, your, with your assistant and you dissect where is the inferior ligament of the pulmonary, inferior pulmonary ligament. And you can just dissecting in the, the tissue, you find the, the esophagus. And you push esophagus just a millimeter or two anteriorly and to the left, and you are right at the aorta. And you can put a small pus string and put a size six French cannula there and connect it like that. Now this cannula will provide the circulation to the lower body. And now this cannula, which is on the top, is going to the, to the head and neck. And you can put snares there. If you put the snares there, obviously you isolated the heart and you can give cardioplegia and do intracardiac repair. But you can, just, you can dissect all what you want to dissect. Even in certain situations where the left subclavian artery is causing a problem, you can just disconnect it and leave it ligated there. And resect all the ductal tissue or the ductal arch tissue and you end up with something like this. So with that situation, I go and anastomose the posterior wall to the posterior wall and anteriorly I, I put a pad using a bovine pericardial pad. That leave this area very nicely, uh, not under tension and very, very relaxed anastomosis of a good size. And because we are perfusing the upper part of the body and the lower part of the body, you're not worried too much about a renal dysfunction or hepatic issues or whatever. And these children have behaved really well. And I have done quite a few and I, I'm happy with that. Obviously there are more than one techniques of doing it. People have employed deep hypothermia, only cerebral perfusion, all, all sorts of things. But this is what has worked in my hands consistently. Late complications will be like after you repaired it and you repaired the VSD at the same time because in, if you look at this and you, you put these, uh, you snare them down here, and give some cardiopathy, you're almost cross clamped. So you open the, if you have bicable venous cannulation, you go and uh, through the right atrium and, and close the VSD or any other cardiac defect if it's amenable or requiring surgery at that time. Later complications can be that increasing pressure gradient across the repair. The repair area can become narrow, so they, these children need to be followed up regularly one month, three months, six months later by echoes and see that area. And if it's narrow these days, they can easily balloon by later. LB outflow tract obstruction obviously will need a bigger operation if it's really become troublesome then they will need some, some type of a cone repair. And left bronchial compression, again, you might need to redo the, 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 the area which was narrowed by putting a, a bigger patch or some form of aortopexy has worked in certain situations. Luckily, it's not that common. And with the type of repairs we do, we don't see it. The last one, I'm, I'm sure I've bored you enough. And I have given this the title ring slings and other things. This is how somebody who Peter Manning used to his presentation ring slings and other things. It's not only a ring or vascular sling. It can be one aberrant artery, whatever, giving the same symptoms. The symptoms 
all the rings and springs of aorta which we talk about aorta or the pulmonary artery or the apparent arteries the symptoms are related to the compression on the trachea and esophagus um, so they symptomatically or in clinical presentation they are all similar and they can be anything they can be a complete ring they can be a partial ring they can be an apparent origin of the left subclavian artery left pulmonary artery or apparent subclavian arteries coursing behind the esophagus and trachea uh, they are rare 1% anomalies of thoracic aorta and pulmonary arteries and they may produce partial or complete rings you, yeah you can say partial rings or complete rings surrounding the esophagus and trachea uh, this is again it, it just a cartilage but if you if you know well, all, all of you are surgeons so you might have seen the aorta is anterior and it hugs the the, the trachea and, and esophagus mostly on the left side it's just adjacent to it it's not curling around it or passing around it in any and the branches go on the sides and they are not in any way uh, encircling the trachea or esophagus. The pulmonary arteries are here and again the pulmonary arteries are not encircling any part of the, of the, of the trachea or the bronchus or the esophagus. This is normal. But in any situation where they form a ring or a string around this trachea or esophagus, they will be compressing on the trachea or esophagus. And symptoms will be compression symptoms of stridor, wheezing, respiratory distress, high pitched cough that they have some, they say like the, the, the steel cough. But anyway, mostly the, the recurrent symptoms of, me, of, of being a chesty and a wheezy child who's coughing, pneumonias and asthma. Then there is a suspicion, has he got, has he got a, a, a ring or something, some vascular compression? Some of the children have been treated for asthma for a long time and then found to be having some, uh, these, these type of abnormalities. Dysphagia with difficulty in feeding. Yes, if the esophagus is compressed to a degree, then they will have difficulty in feeding. And, uh, previously, uh, people used to do the contrast follow esophagograms to, to find an extrinsic compression of that. Rarely done these days. Again, associated with 22 Q deletion and intracardiac defects. But I want to warn you about trichomalacia. Trichomalacia is a common association and can give you a lot of problems post operative if you do not think about it or rule it out pre operative. The two commonest. 85 to 90 percent of the rings are these rings. That there is left double aortic arch, a right and a left, and this they they very neatly circle the the the, the esophagus and the and the trachea between them. Um, you can divide any of the arch. You usually divide the one which is anteriorly if they are of similar size, but if the if, the, if, if one is bigger than the other, then obviously you will try to leave the bigger arch. And you have to make sure that you, you have the correct understanding of where, where to divide. Because you don't want to divide where you compromise arch vessels. Also divide the, the ligamentum and release the adhesions between this, in this area, between the esophagus and the, and the, and the, and the, and the ring-like structure around it. Usually there are some fibrous adhesions. And it is said that if you don't lyse these adhesions, then the symptoms persist. The other, the other variety is when there's a right, a right aortic arch and the aorta descend normally to the left again. And there's a ductus which is attached to the cumeral diverticulum on the left subclavian artery. The left subclavian artery so it takes off from these aorta. It's, it's usually much lower than this shown in this picture and a little bit posterior. So this ligamentum goes behind it and is attached there. And this cumeral diverticulum itself, which is the thickening of the beginning of the left subclavian artery, adds to the compression. So 
you have to dissect it out, divide the ligamentum, take the left subclavian artery, like cut it out, and you can reconstomose it with one of the neck arteries or any, another position. Or in some cases which you can't, you just leave it alone and hope that you don't develop a jambus healing, which, which happens most often. You don't develop a jambus healing. So these two are the commonest. Remember these two. The commonest are uh, the, Sorry? Mr. Roy, why would you divide the, the verticulum? Because as I said, it's not exactly like sitting here, a little bit low, and it's behind the, behind the esophagus and trachea. By its size, it compresses from behind. Oh, OK. Yeah. OK. But if it's not compressing, there is no uh, harm in leaving it, supplying no, the no, left circle. No, no. But oh, okay. dissect, dissect it and open it. Think of a mm -hmm. ring and open the ring and, and lies the, the fibrous tissue between this ring and the aorta and esophagus, uh, esophagus and trachea, so that this area is, is, is released. Okay. So these four are the complete rings. Uh, they might ask you in the exam, what are the four complete rings? The four complete rings are double aortic arch, right arch with left ligamentum, which I showed you, right arch with mirror image branching, and left heart with ligamentum with retroesophageal right subclavian artery. So these are the four complete rings. The other are incomplete rings or slings or whatever you call it. And they can also cause the same compression. If, if you want the diagnosis to be best established, PT or MRI will best establish your diagnosis where the facility is available. Echo will still has to be done to rule out intracardiac defects, especially in right aortic arch cases. Bronchoscopy should be a part of the preoperative assessment in all cases. This is what the textbook says. Though sometimes when we do the CT scan, they can tell you that there's not much bronchial compression. A bronchoscopy should also tell you about complete tracheal rings and whatever. So you need to do some tracheal procedure. At that time or in the future, you will be mentally prepared or you will ask somebody to help you with that. But remember that tracheomalacia and bronchial compression can be very troublesome and uh, cause, cause you a lot of morbidity and even sometimes mortality. Multiple studies have shown that some degree of airway obstruction, we are not talking about the anatomical obstruction, the airway obstruction in the smaller bronchial and bronchial level in 50% of these patients. So don't be surprised that you did a very nice uh, ring repair or surgically treated and the, the, the child is still presenting, still need nebulization, then still need with, is still wheezy because there is an association and you have to be up to seven to eight years, it has been noticed that they slowly come out of it. And it has been also noticed that they have more pronounced bronchial responsiveness to histamine. So their pulmonary uh, circulation, their, 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 their bronchial velar system is more. Uh, sensitive and more reactive. They are like asthmatic. So this is an association. Though you, you treat it the anatomical ring or sling or whatever it was, but it can still have a respiratory symptom. Surgical correction, obviously surgical correction will depend on what you find mostly. Left thoracotomy is done. In rare cases where the arch is on the right side and also the the sling or the ring is more toward the right side, you might need to do a right record, but that's rare. Most of the things are done by the left record. Wax procedures are done, even for the double aortic arches, area centers which have the expertise, they can do it with the wax with probably less morbidity. Uh, median stenotomy is required for pulmonary artery slings. You cannot do a pulmonary artery sling because it's, it's, it's the left pulmonary artery coming from the right pulmonary artery, and you have to, to, to dissect it out and re it in, in, in another position, and you'll have to do it on the peripheral bypass. Uh, there are rare anomalies, and, but I think I, almost all centers see them in a few cases uh, per year. So, but with the rings and slings, don't get excited when you, you get a double aortic arch or a ring. To, to take it to surgery immediately or whatever. Plan carefully, go through imaging and other data and discuss discuss the imaging with your imaging colleagues. 
more often I have found it more helpful to me for myself because the pediatric cardiologist will bring an echo and say, oh, this is the echo of the child. And he also has a thing. And I can see this is the artery going there. But what about the other issues? Go to the CT scan. Go to the radiologist down there. Sit with them and see what they are, what they are seeing. Not only the the, the, the anomaly of the, the great vessels, but also the, the area of the compression, especially the bronchial compression. And because if you, this is a this is a quote which I like. I think you have seen it before. It's from Walter Millihai. That good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. And we all, in our surgical careers, made bad bad judgments and became experienced. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doctor. You gave us uh, four lectures in one session. He's, I'm sorry, he's sure. not good justice, but I tried to, to squeeze them. Through. No, it was uh, very good and uh, comprehensive lectures. Thank you very much for your time and effort. Uh, I have one question, Doctor. We talked about uh, VSD in the first lecture, and we talked about we talked about uh, uh, coarctation. Now, if we have a new unit uh, who is who presented with uh, uh, with hemodynamic uh, collapse due to his coarctation, uh, and uh, before taking him to surgery, he was found to have a VSD, uh, which is um, not significant restrictive VSD, um, and that VSD is not causing any uh, major uh, heart failure symptoms. Uh, so, and this. In this uh, stage, will you go for uh, both uh, coarctation and VSD repair, or you, or you will do the coarctation and leave the VSD for later? No, I would do the coarctation and the PA band. You can do the PA band from the same left that I got me. Yeah. And uh, a couple of times, the, though the VSD appears to be restrictive, like four millimeter, five millimeter, and it's restrictive. It. And the cardiologist tell you, oh, just ignore it. it. It is going to take care of itself. But at mm -hmm. least I remember three cases where I had to go back and do something for the VSD uh, within within the like two three weeks. So I cursed myself at that stage when you are doing a coarctation, you can put a PA band, and as you know the formula, the trusted formula of 20 millimeter plus one millimeter for every kg. So a three yes. three kg child, a circumferential band of 23 millimeter has always worked. Trust me, it always works. And uh, in a few months' time, when the VSD is closed, you can remove this band. But I, uh, yes, if it's really, really restrictive, very small, two, less than three millimeter, I would say I would not do a band. But if it's more than four millimeter, I would do a band at the same time. But yeah, but if it's a big, much larger VSD, yeah. then you can do it in, 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 in children. You can do the same like you did in, we, we talked about in, in interruption. You can do from on, on the bypass, and you can do coarctation as well as the VSD in, in one go. Okay. Usually, it is a small VSD uh, in the coarctation, associated with coarctation. And a band and coarctation repair is my and favorite. Really, it, it's of the, one of the muscular uh, VSDs, right? Usually, it's a yeah. muscular VSD. It's the muscular VSD. Again, you have to follow them closely. The muscular yeah. VSDs usually don't cause problem, but they, then they and they are also amenable to be closed in the cath lab. Yeah. They, they are, all the all the pediatric interventional cardiologists are happy to do them in the cath lab. It, the, the problem arises when it is perimembranous VSD, isn't it? Yeah. So they, this, they are, this, they are, this, yeah. They're not going to tackle we, it. Yeah, and we don't expect them to uh, close. Um, no. if we leave it. Yeah. No, no. But the muscular is not usually a problem. A muscular VSD, yeah, they can. You, you do your coarctation and see the patient afterward. And if you're still symptomatic or not being, uh, not thriving well on the medical management for a few weeks, you can go back to the cath lab and they devise it. Any questions? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Atizaz. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Atizaz, one, uh, one follow-up question regarding uh, 
patient like in young uh, young adult with QR plus uh, aortic stenosis, for example, uh, the consequence will be uh, first to fix the QR by interventional, then we'll fix the aortic stenosis, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, as I said to you before, the cardiologists are encroaching on our areas. And I won't be surprised if somebody would tell you that I would take this patient and put a stent in the quart and do a trans transfemur, what is the TAVI type of well procedure. Not for stenosis, not for stenosis though. Or, but, you know, they are getting, but if, if you ask me what, what to do, I think uh, if the aortic stenosis is not very severe, I would do like a squawk first mm -hmm. and leave him for a few weeks, let's say a month or six weeks. A quark you can do from the side and then do his stenotomy and fix the aortic valve at the end. That'd be safest. Uh, we are talking about aortic stenosis. Yes, aortic stenosis. Yeah, and aortic stenosis is usually by cuspid aortic valve and they are associated with aortopathy. Yes. Yeah. So it's not it's not like not something which you take lightly. So if you, if you, if he has a discrete cooperation, or I will get if I have an expertise, I will ask my colleague to to put a stent in the quark, wait for. Again, again, six weeks, I'm saying it's empirical because I think by then the, 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 the issue is that if you put them on bypass and put an aortic cannula because of the, the flow in the aortic cannula, you may cause dissection at some point which has been recently interfered with either surgically or on, in the cat lab. In six weeks, I think they yield sufficiently to not give you that, that problem. And you can do the usual, usual cannulation in well surgery or whatever you like. I see. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know Thank if you. there is any other question. Thank you, Dr. Atizas. Thank you all. Yeah, Shukran. So, I'll see you next time, inshallah. Inshallah, Dr. Inshallah. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much. Alaikum salam. Allah, take me